This is a story of three illustrious men. Who are they? What is the connection between them? Well, I think we all know the one on the left, you know, the one looking very studious. So, we'll leave him for a while and start with the one at the top. Our man at the top is Lawrence of Arabia, Thomas Edward Lawrence. He had many exploits in the Arabian desert from 1916 to 1918. With the Allied victory in 1918 came great disappointment for the Arabs when they were informed of the Allies' decision regarding the future of Syria. Lawrence immediately returned to London to present the Arab point of view to the British government, but he had little success. In an act of protest, he refused to accept medals from the King. Here we have Lawrence looking quite different in the uniform of a Lieutenant Colonel. In 1920, Churchill called Lawrence back into government service to work as an advisor to the Colonial Office. After the Cairo conference in March 1921, Faisal was installed as the ruler of Iraq. At last, Lawrence thought an honourable settlement had been reached. So, how does the third man, Flying Officer W.E. Johns, enter this tale? William Earl Johns was a bomber pilot in World War I. After the war, he remained with the Royal Air Force as a flying officer, and in 1922 was in the Inspectorate of Recruiting in London. We may know him better as Captain W. E. Johns, the author of the Biggle stories. The Captain is a courtesy title. Tired of the limelight, Lawrence tried to escape his fame, and so on the 30th of August 1922, Lawrence reported for induction at Henrietta Street, Covent Garden. He was supposed to be John Hume Ross, born in 1894 with no prior military service. But John sensed there was something offhand about his manner, almost amounting to insolence, that I took an instinctive dislike to him. John's told Ross that he needed a birth certificate and three character references. While Ross was away, John's contacted Somerset House and discovered that there was no record of Ross's birth. So, when Ross returned with the character references, Johns challenged them, and Lawrence admitted they were fake references. Lawrence left, but returned with an RAF messenger, who gave Johns an order to enlist Lawrence as John Hume Ross. Later, while waiting for the train to Earthbridge, the RAF training base, Lawrence had a long chat with Johns and acknowledged his identity. Johns phoned an Earthbridge colleague immediately to warn him of who was on the way. So Johns had the distinction of turning down Lawrence's application for the Royal Air Force in 1922. Lawrence enjoyed his time in the RAF until his identity was discovered by the press, and so he requested to be transferred to the tank corps. As for Johns, he retired from the Royal Air Force in 1927 and continued writing under the name of Captain W. E. Johns. He wrote some 104 Biggle stories and kept writing right up to his death in 1968. And now, let's look at John Buchan's role in this story. In 
In 1916, Buchan was the Director of Information, becoming the Director of Military Intelligence in 1918. He knew of Lawrence, and they became firm friends after the war. Their friendship blossomed. Lawrence was a frequent visitor to Buchan at his home in Ellsfield. In 1925, Buchan used his influence with Prime Minister Baldwin to have Lawrence transferred from the Tank Corps to the Royal Air Force, this time as T.E. Shaw. He wrote a letter to Buchan thanking him. It reads, Dear Buchan, the Oracle responded nobly. I was sent for by Trenchard on Wednesday last. Horribly inconvenient for my revolver course did not finish till Saturday yesterday, and was told that I was acceptable as a recruit. The immediate effect of this news was to put me lazily and smoothly asleep, and asleep I have been ever since. It's like a sudden port after a voyage all out of reckoning. I owe, I owe you the very deepest of thanks. I've been hoping for this for so many years, and had my hopes turned down regularly, that my patience was completely exhausted, and I began wondering if it had ever been worth waiting and hoping for. Odd that the Air Force should seem to me, after a trial or two, as the only way of getting across middle age. I wish I could make you some sort of return. Formalities will take some weeks, but I should change skins in September at latest. Please inform your family that the bike did 108 miles an hour with me on Wednesday afternoon. I think this news of my transfer had gone to its heads, cylinder heads, of course. More thanks. Yours ever, T.E. Shaw. As for Lawrence, he enjoyed his years in the Royal Air Force. He spent his time travelling, usually on one of his beloved Bruff Superior motorcycles. His trips could range from 600 to 700 miles a day, visiting friends such as Winston Churchill, John Buchan, and Nancy Astor. On one occasion, he raced with a Sopworth Camel biplane. In 1935, John Buchan was appointed Governor General of Canada. In a letter to Buchan dated April 1935, Lawrence writes, I read yesterday in the paper that you have been chosen as next Governor-General of Canada, a high office to which I grudge you immensely. It means that for three years you will be spent on public functions, doing them excellently, no doubt, but at the sacrifice of all your private virtue. Also, I shall feel that something is missing round Ellsfield Way. This is perhaps a queer way of congratulating you on breaking into another preserve of the Lord's. Cromwell would approve it. But still, I feel sorry. You are too good to become a figure. On the 13th of May, 1935, just a few weeks after his letter to Buchan, and two months after leaving the Royal Air Force, Lawrence crushed on his beloved Bruff Superior and died six days later. To this day, mystery still surrounds the accident.